you all. Shabbat Shalom and welcome to a few quality moments around the Shabbat table with the Rabbi's son. This morning it is beautiful in the place where I live, which is Texarkana, Texas, USA. The flowers are blooming, the sun is shining, the birds are singing. It is a day to start something fresh and new, and that would be the third book, the third course book of the Holy One's comprehensive training manual called Vaikra. Uh, in English, or through the Latin uh, passageway that we got, this book is called Leviticus. The, the Latin saw it as something irrelevant, something uh, something that didn't need to be discussed anymore, laws of the Levites. Uh, that's why they called it Leviticus, meaning laws of the Levites. That is not the name of the book, and that is not the essence of the book, and that is not the substance of what we're going to be studying. Not a bunch of stuff we could relegate to history, or to some other era, or to some ceremonial set of laws. No, Vayikra is the essential protocols of hosting the divine presence and of resonating with his true tone, and of recalibrating as necessary to return to that true tone, to that sweet spot. So welcome to Parsha 24 uh, of the Torah cycle in general, uh, Parsha number one of the third Sefer of Torah, the third book of Torah, which is called Vaikra. Oh, I hope we have quite the adventure in this period of time. So, what have we been doing as we've been uh, getting ready to learn these essential protocols of hosting the presence of the Holy One? We have been on a quest, beloved. <laughs> I told you last week about why we do this sort of thing. We are on a quest, seeking the faith, seeking to know the Holy One, the creator of the universe, the way he wants us to know him. Not through some tilted or stilted lens of philosophy, uh, agnosticism, uh, uh, atheism or even forms of organized religion, but as he really seeks us to, to know him uh, through his own messages, through his own words. And so we have begun with Genesis 1-1 uh, and this adventure. We do it every year. We take this quest, this journey every year. And our, our journey started with a great vision, the creator's vision, the grand plan for creation. We found it in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Torah, and uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. And it was creator vision. And we proceeded from creator vision uh, in that same set of, of readings to creator technique. He has a certain unique signature. He, he has a mark of excellence that sets him apart from any other a nation or culture or ethnicity or any person in the world, any genius in the world, he sets himself apart by the creator technique or the Elohim signature. Uh, we learned about how he baraz. That means he, we, we, in English we say he creates. But he, he speaks and he begins to cause things to form. And that's what it is. And the, he uses the, the, the debar, the, the, the sound of his voice and the words, the impact of his, his intellect coming through the voice. And then he begins to separate things out according to that. That's how his creator technique. It's, it's, it repeats itself over and over again. Not just in the creation story, but in all of the Torah, all of the Bible, all the prophets, all the writings, and all of the teachings of Yeshua and his uh, Talmudim. I did the, the creator technique, the Elohim signature is all through it. So we've got creator vision and the grand plan for the redemption of mankind as a species and for the re restoration of creation to its original intended state of beauty and fruitfulness and shalom. We've got a creator vision. And now we see a little bit of the creator technique developing and coming out. So we're getting to know it. Our quest is working a little bit. We're getting to know our creator afresh. And then he introduces us to this beautiful thing called I call creator speak. The Lashon HaKodesh, the language, the speech in the holy tongue. He chose the language of Hebrew because it was so good at communicating essential, deep, uh, eternal truths. And bringing those eternal truths into mankind's mind and, and, and heart. Not just loaning to what he sees on the page, but what is jumping uh, behind the scenes, behind the letters on the page. The truth, the deep things that go deep calling unto deep. So we learn creator speak, or we learn to be at least be attentive to it, listening for it. 
the language, the tone, the vocabulary, the phrasing, the specific diction and the timing and the sequence of his words. He's strategic, and so he introduced us to Creator Speak through Creator Discourse. It started just a few speeches, like calling Avraham and then speaking to Avraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. And then he began to speak to all the nation that, uh, and we got into the book of Exodus, the second book of Torah. And he began to speak to grand, uh, on Sinai to all people. And even if he was speaking to Moshe, he was speaking to all people through Moshe at the later part. So we learn not just creator vision and creator technique, the Elohim signature, but creator speak. And then we proceeded toward the end of the book of Exodus to learning creator script. He actually wrote with his own finger, with the power, the energy of heaven. He inscribed on tablets of stone very, the, the aspects of creator speak that would redefine the earth, that would come release, release to earth, given to human beings, would begin to emanate that power, release that power of recreation, of restoration into the world. So creator speak became the foundation of everything that we do. Creator script became the foundation of the foundation. And then we learned last week about creator energy and the synergy it creates. If you, if creator begins to release energy, it begins to synergize and call forth people. Kedusha downflows, holiness downflows. The energy that fuels heaven downloads into the earth. And it has immediate and, and long-term consequences and, see, and impact on human beings. Oh, it brings about such wonderful things we've been learning in our quest. It brings about inspiration and impetus and empowerment and all these things together, working together, make for a, a whole that is far greater than the sum of the individual parts. Uh, that's what creator energy and synergy does. Well, we're about to move into a new book of Torah, the third course book on creator knowledge, creator quest. And this third book, it begins to introduce us to something else. Creator calibration techniques. Creator calibration. Program. In other words, if we get off the, the tone, if we get away from creator vision techniques, speak, script, and energy and synergy, if we get away and start doing our own thing, he has calibration techniques to bring us back, to reconnect us, to fine-tune us again. And so that's what the book of Vayikra is going to be all about, the product process of recalibration once we have slipped aside from the, the true tone. Uh, of the Holy One. Now, uh, the, the name of the Torah, the name of the, the book, and the name of the Parsha this week, all are the same. Vayikra. Vayikra, Hebrew phrase, which usually is translated into English as and he called. But this word kara at the heart, vayikra, you hear the kara in there. The kara is a Hebrew word, uh, and this Hebrew verb is used uh, to establish identity and purpose and boundaries. It's not just just speaking out loud. It's, it's, it's having a, a purpose for speaking out loud to establish identity, purpose, and boundaries, to single out and set apart uniquely for a purpose. So, for instance, uh, first usage was Genesis 1-5, the first day of creation. It's part of the Elohim signature. It marks the divine creativity. And it said, then Elohim karad, in English we say called, it loses the sense. Elohim karad the light, yom, he called. He set it apart. He gave, established its identity, its purpose, its boundaries. He singled it out uniquely set it apart for a purpose that's what kara means so when he says he starts this book and this series of, of lessons on stewarding the presence of god with by cry it means that there he is marking us apart marking us establishing our identity and purpose and boundaries as being his to reflect absorb then reflect and exude his holiness his essence of who he is so then elohim harad the light Yom, English day, and the darkness, he karad, Leila, and in English we call that night. Well, these are not just names he's giving to things. And then when he talked to Adam, he gave Adam the power to, to karah everything he brought before him. And so Adam didn't just give names to giraffes and elephants and alligators. He, he actually decreed their identity in creation, their purpose in creation, their boundaries in creation, their, and he singled them out and set them apart uniquely for the purpose according to the divine plan. That's what Adam did for all the creatures in Genesis 2.19. Oh, that's a lot to start with. That's where we are on the grand journey, the grand quest 
of seeking to know the Holy One the way He desires to be known. And having Him know us the way He desires for us to know He knows us. So we are at the beginning of book three of the course book. Uh, it's a new beginning. And welcome to this new beginning. But it is a higher level of functionality, of societal impact, and of accountability. Are you ready for that? I hope you are. I hope what we've done so far in these discussions around the rabbi's son Shabbat table have got you hungry and excited because I can't do it. My words can't do it. Uh, but the, the synergy of the Holy One working through me and through you and through the world and through his words is bringing about this calling to a higher level of functionality in the world of social societal impact and of accountability to the divine standard, to the uh, true tone, to the correct course. So here we are today. On this Shabbat, we will break the seal for the third sefer, the third book of Torah. This is the book of practicing the presence of the king. Ah, it's so beautiful because it teaches us how to, to live in the presence and carry the presence of the Holy One and not... Uh, profane it and not to uh, ignore it and not to take it for granted but to always stay in tune on course on time and maintain con kingdom quality levels of kedusha the energy that fuels the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the cherubim and the seraphim in the throne room of heaven now, we've been through two books of Torah already. We have this one and two more to go. Uh, beware of what, hitting the wall. Uh, the, the, the wall of this quest. We, it's, this becomes where the, the text is next level detailed. It's deep water text. We've enjoyed some sweeping stories, spellbinding, feel-good stories in many cases uh, uh, that are filled and come from the movies that we we are familiar with focusing on, the Ten Commandments and, and the greatest, whatever, all the things you can imagine, the movies that you read. Epic, spellbinding, feel-good stories. That's not this book. This book is next-level details. It's deep water. And on the Peshat, the other thing about this, the reason it could be the wall for us in our quest to stop us and hinder us or cause us to lose energy in our quest is because by the direct meaning, the literal meaning, the Peshat, as it's called in Hebrew, the subject matter being covered is tabernacle, discipline, and, doc, and protocol. Tabernacle, discipline, protocol. And there's a problem with that for our linearly thinking Greek westernized minds. Because we see if there's no tabernacle on earth, no physical structure on earth to practice these tabernacle disciplines and protocols in anymore, then what point is there in reading this? What, what is the essence of going through all this detail and all these, all these narratives and all this divine speech to find what? What are we going to do with all this stuff if we learn it? So it's kind of like a place where we could hit the wall. Plus, if you, if you want to be honest about it, the book of Leviticus is embarrassingly personal. It talks about some subjects we don't like to talk about in polite <laughs> company. It's messy. It, it, some of the stuff is, there's blood and there's, and there's entrails and, and, it, and there's pain and, and, and it's extremely, it's real. <laughs> oh, but don't we need something real finally after all the fluff and all the huff? And all the, the hyperbole and all the hype of modern religion. Can't we get to something real? Yes, it's embarrassing and personal. Yes, it's extremely messy. Yes, it's sometimes a little scary. And yes, it is convicting. And that's why I think the real reason is most people hit a wall here. They don't like the feeling of being convicted that, yes, this applies to me. And I need to deal with it. Ah, not on the surface level of killing animals or bringing, bringing uh, grain or, or doing this, that, and the other thing in the entrance to the tabernacle, but in our devotional lives and in our relational lives. So it's a little scary, it's convicting, and it's complicated. But wait, this book. <laughs> don't throw it away so fast. Don't let yourself get distracted by the strength of this wall, the height of this wall, the challenge this book presents. At the, it is the heart of the Torah. It is the, you got two books, this book in the center. This is the centerpiece of the Torah. So we got two books and then this book. 
and then two more books. And so at the heart of the Torah, Parsha is 24 through 33 of the 54. We're right in the middle. And this is the Holy One who does all things Hebraically. And that means starting in the middle and going outward and building according to the pattern in the middle. So this is the heart of the Torah. Not only that, this is the highlights reel of the B'nai Israel Chronicles. Not the epic stories. This is how it works. If it's going to work, this is how it works. There's got to be something going on in the individuals and in the community of B'nai Israel, of this covenant people of the Holy One, to make the whole plan of creation, of the whole plan of re- restoration and redemption work. So this is the highlight reel of B'nai Israel's Chronicles. Plus, this corresponds with some of the most important times of the year. The readings of this book, when we do this this third book of Torah, we, we're, we're getting ready for Purim, which is coming soon, for Passover, for Unleavened Bread, for Sephirot HaOmer, the counting of the Omer, leading all the way up to Shavuot, or the Feast of, of Pentecost. So this is an important time of the year. This is the heart of the Torah and the, and the, sequence, the critical sequence at the beginning of the, of, the, of the meetings with the Holy One we have, the Moedim. Plus, this book, more than any of the other five books of Torah, contains more, much more divine speech, much more creator speak. It is almost exclusively creator speak. Only, only a couple of, of, fra- uh, of phrases are added by Moshe. A couple of stories are told. Only two stories in the entire book. The rest of the books have been full of stories. This only has two stories. Exception number one, the story number one is the eighth day narrative of Leviticus 9 through 10, which we'll discuss in two weeks. The second exception we won't talk about for a long time. Exception number two is, or the non-creator speak, the actual story that line is the blasphemer narrative of Leviticus 24. All the rest of this entire book is creator speak. It's discourse after discourse. It contains the Kedusha discourse, the longest and most detailed, most intimate and most powerful discourse of the Torah, which includes the love chapter, chapter uh, 19, in which we actually see the, uh, the, the love your neighbor mitzvah in context, in its proper context, not just some theory. And so we then we see that this is also the book that Hebrew children have been for generations starting their Torah education. At age three, they don't start with Genesis in the year that they turn three. They start with Leviticus. When it come time comes around for Vayikra and he called, they respond to the call. Their childlike, faith-filled hearts respond to the calling to the deep, calling unto deep. Ah, so this is important. We cannot skip this. So I'm going to give you a little uh, advance. We were talking about laws of spiritual science parallel to the laws of physical science. That, that this I teaches in the, in the course book. But this is a law of spiritual science that I have evolved usually from the teachings of Messiah as he's interpreting Torah. This is no exception. The ninth law of spiritual science we'll talk about today is that what is recorded in the Torah not only tells the story of the people of God historically, but it also describes our prophetic destiny. It tells what will happen and continue to happen and will always happen because we are of the bloodline and we are of the calling of the Holy One. What is recorded in Torah not only tells the story of the people of God historically, but it also describes our prophetic destiny. It keeps happening over and over again and we're called to make it happen over and over again. What is the text? What is the Yeshua's teaching? Uh, Matthew 5.18 For truly, I tell you, until the heavens and the earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means be removed from the Torah until everything is accomplished. Ah, what is recorded in the Torah not only tells the story of the people of God historically, it also describes your prophetic destiny my prophetic destiny, and the world's prophetic destiny. So perhaps, beloved, it is time to radically rethink the book that Western religion and the religious world in general calls Leviticus. This is not an outdated and irrelevant book of laws for Levites, written by Moses out of his own mind, as the religious world would have you believe. This is not the law of Moses. It is instead an inspiring and empowering marriage manual for lovers and servants of God, seekers of God, 
those who hunger to serve God, written by the Holy One Himself for all who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. It's applicable in all places, in all generations, and at all times. You just have to listen. It's with a messianic ear. What do I mean by a messianic ear? Beloved, if you remember, if you will remember that what happened with Messiah, when he talked about the Torah, when he introduced uh, his view and, and what he was teaching about the Torah in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you know, you've got to go deeper than the, the, paper, the, the lines on the paper and the words on the paper. I know, it drives literal interpretationists crazy. But Yeshua said, you, you know, you've heard it said, for instance, you should not kill. That's the words on the script. Oh, but there's an energy in those words that goes far deeper than the actual words and the actual literal translation. He said, therefore, I'm telling you that the deeper things include, you remember what he said, that you will not uh, hate your brother in your heart, that you, you will not be angry with your brother. You will not say, speak to him or about him in negative, angry, offended ways. That's all caught up in underneath, dancing behind the words, you shall not, you will not kill. Now do you understand? That's the way it is with the Messianic interpretation of everything in the Torah. You have to look behind the lines. If there's something you cannot do, like for instance the tabernacle disciplines and protocols, uh, you find there's something dancing behind there that's calling you to do it at a deeper level. At the level of the mind, at the level of the heart, at the level of the imagination, at the level of the emotions, and how you deal with your own self and your self-will. This is what you're called to do behind the scenes. This is messianic interpretation, messianic application. Well, this is a marriage manual then for lovers and servants of God. Written by the Holy One Himself for those who are called according to His purpose. Applicable in all times. As we start then, as we begin our journey through the third book of Torah, Vayikra, called Leviticus by the Western world, welcome to the era of Emmanuel, the prototypical era of God with us. Emmanuel. Behold, the tabernacle of God abides with men. And he has descended upon it, as we found in the last chapter of Exodus. Before we start this book, the last chapter ended off with the Holy One descending, his Shekinah presence descending upon it and filling the tabernacle and the, the uh, physical structure on earth with his manifest presence and glory. How can we maintain that? How can we deal with that? In such a spiritually supercharged environment, you see, every word has multiple levels and shades of meaning. And every picture Every image we see tells a passion play quality story. Can I repeat that for you? In such a spiritually supercharged environment as we are now beginning to look at in, in our quest, every word that we will read has multiple levels and shades of meaning. And every picture that we will see, every image that we will see tells a passion play quality story. This is our story. This is our song. What is the overall theme of Sefer Vayikra, this third book? Ah, beloved, we're sitting around the Shabbat table enjoying a little quality time here, but we're going to get pretty deep here quickly. <laughs> overall theme of Sefer Vayikra is the calling of the bridegroom king to his bride people. Be holy as I am holy. As to the extent for the reasons, in the ways that I am holy. Now this is shocking. This is the, this is why I tell you this is the heart of the Torah. Be holy as I am holy is his call. He's going to repeat it five or six times in this book. And he's not going to end with this book. In Torah, Kepha, Peter is going to repeat this in chapter one, verses 15 and 16. He's going to take this theme back up and say this is the essence of being the people of God. Calling the bridegroom king upon to and unto his bride people, be holy as I am holy. Well, this is the essence of the calling of this book. And with the season of, that we're about to enter in our quest to find and get to know and get to be known by the Holy One the way we're supposed to, is we're going to be dealing with becoming holy as he is holy. Ha! 
the transformative energy that is inherent in being with him, his Emmanuel, his being close to us, uh, where we can absorb his energy, where we absorb his impetus, where we can absorb his holiness and begin to exude that in the world. So that's our thing. But be holy as I am holy, as he is holy. Uh, we're going to need a little help on that assignment, right? I mean, that's a tall order. If you can see the, the imagery, I always teach from PowerPoints. And so uh, if you can see the imagery on my PowerPoint, I've got a picture of a wild horse who's been captured and is looking at the one who captured him like, you think you're going to tame me? <laughs> you think I'm going to do what you want to do? You think I'm going to be holy as you are holy? Would be our way of looking at to the Holy One. How can that even happen? We're going to need a little help on the assignment. Not to worry. That's what the book of Vayikra is all about. It's our help to become holy as he is holy. So this book is going to introduce true tone. The sound that we can adjust to, tune our hearts to, tune our minds to, tune our behaviors to, tune our focus to, introducing true tone. If you play any stringed instruments, you know what it means when your string gets out of tune. You know that it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't work well with other chords, with other st strings. It doesn't sound, it, it doesn't make the notes you want to make. It doesn't play the songs you want to play. True tone, you have to tr tune it back to true tone. There's a sweet spot. <laughs> uh, and that sweet spot for us in the Torah and for the people of God is the divine vision, is the course he has charted for us, the divine vision for a kingdom priest and a holy nation to have its maximum impact upon the world. Ah, it is a beautiful thing. But it requires us to ignore the impetus uh, to, to, to go to uh, flesh and things that might appeal to our flesh or distract our minds or get uh, our pseudo-intellect all fired up with ideology and politics and formal religious discussions and debates and those sorts of things. We've got to ignore that impetus and, and respond to the impetus to return, to get back to the sweet spot of the true tone. Ah, uh, but ignore the impetus to return to true tone at your and at your families and at your spheres of influence is peril because that is ugly whenever you get out of tune from the Holy One. The book of Leviticus, Sefer Vayikra, is an ultimate respondes s'il vous plaît, RSVP invitation. The bridegroom king of heaven is inviting us, beloved, you and me to visit him at his palace, to come before him, to heal, to grow in grace and wisdom, to learn the disciplines of serving as courtiers and emissaries of his kingdom and reflecting his light and carrying that light to the world. He is inviting us. This is his RSVP. Will you come? The, dis the calling, and he called Vahikra. The discourses that are going to follow in Vahikra, the multiple discourses uh, that he's going to put in this book, are breadcrumbs strewn along the path. He says, come, but we have to follow the strewn breadcrumb trail on the path that leads. Where is it leading? It leads us to the cherubim, past the cherubim, back to the garden, and back to the tree of life. Yes, this book is important. <laughs> oh, but there are some uh, things we're going to have to unlearn along the way, as it always is with this particular quest. And the uh, time we spend around the rabbi's son's Shabbat table is designed to help you see what you need to let go of and see what you need to, to disinvest, deinvest from. Certain words that are used in English that have become such a part of our spiritual vocabulary, or I should say our religious vocabulary, need to be let go of in light of what was really said by the Holy One. We're going to first start with words like offering and sacrifice. I wish they hadn't done that, the King James authors, uh, and then the ones who followed the King James uh, editors and, and uh, translators. I wish they hadn't used terms like offerings and sacrifices to describe what is referenced in the book of Leviticus. But they did. So we have to understand that the things that they've told us, the things that we conjure up in our minds when we think of offerings and sacrifices as they are far afield, they are not true tone. 
they are not in the sweet spot. The things we're thinking about are pagan ways of, of manipulating God by making him, bendo him over some words that he has to uh, atone and forgive on the basis of the, it's just like pagans who, who, who really just want something from God. So they throw a, a, a maiden or they throw a bull or they throw a, a pig on an altar and say, here you go. Be satisfied with that and do what I want you to do. That's, that's pagan, pagan idolatry. And that's what we have conjured up with the words offerings and sacrifices in people's minds. Let's break that. Let's break that off of everybody. These are not offerings and sacrifices he's going to talk about. They're korbanot. Korbanot, korban in Hebrew. We I heard you mention korah, which is to call. If you change the last syllable of korah to the next letter from kuf uh, resh aleph to kuf resh bet, you change it from kara to karav. And karav means to draw close in intimacy, to dr- get close to, to get very near to, to, to come into the presence of. Korobanot, plural, means the ways in which you come into the presence of God. This is not offerings and sacrifices designed to manipulate God. This is the protocols, the surrogates through which we come to approach a holy being when we are indeed unholy ourselves. There are other terms. Uh, clean. And unclean, those terms have been used in the King James and the various late, later translations. We're going to see those words a lot in our English text. And we're going to have to realize that is not true Tom. That's not what he's really talking about. He's talking about tahor for clean. He's talking about tame for unclean. And these have Hebrew meanings that are deep. We won't talk about them today. There's too much time. We need to talk about other things. But those are the kinds of things. And then he's going to talk about the profane and the common and the holy, we think, well, what do those terms even mean? They're not true tone. We have to get back to the Hebrew. What we think of as holy is kadash, kodesh. And what we think about as profane is kol. And boy, these, there's dancing behind these words. There are a whole level of, of implications for human beings and how we approach life and each other and things and people in the world. Well, that's our essence of the warning. There are concepts we are going to trade in and let go of and unlearn. Because you see, this whole book is about calibration, recalibration to the true tone. Checking and adjusting to the recognized standard. Ah, like tuning a guitar string to the right note. That's what we're going to be doing in the whole book of Leviticus, getting to where we actually play the right note. Now, I have given you some fundamental laws of spiritual science. The last one uh, that we got before today, I gave you the ninth just at the beginning. But the eighth one was, if we build it per his specifications, he will come, inhabit it, fill it, ecosystem manage it, and he will draw all men and all nations to it. That's a big spiritual law, law, law of spiritual science that we learned. And so now we say, okay, now if it's in the tabernacle, if it's in the Torah in general, but in the tabernacle in particular, it tells a story that we need to be telling. Let's stop what we're doing right now before we get too deep into this and let's sing our call to worship. Would you join me? If you know it and not, just... Close your eyes or just relax as much as you can. Take a breath and then we'll sing this song. Our call to worship our Baraku. Baraku Adonai Hamborach Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Vaed Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher b'akarbanu mikol ha'amin v'natan lanu et torato baruch ata Adonai noten ha'torah. And now may you open our eyes, O Holy One, that we may see wondrous things in your Torah. We are just strangers in this earth. So do not hide your commandments from us. Let's talk about context again for a second before we get into details. How the last book of Torah ended, was it on the first day of Nisan or Aviv, the first day of the first month of the biblical year we were given in Exodus 12? 
which is 11 and a half months after the Exodus on the first day of Nisan in the year at Sinai, at the culmination of the most glorious prototypical season of shalom in the camp and fruitfulness, a, a picture of the Messianic kingdom to come. At the conclusion of that, the cloud came and covered the tabernacle of meeting. Wow. And the glory, the kavod, the weightiness, the majesty of the Holy One filled the tabernacle to the maximum. And it says Moshe even was not able to enter into the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Holy One filled the tabernacle. What an ending! <laughs> what a challenge! The era of Emmanuel, God with us, is truly on. The cloud of the Holy One was upon the tabernacle by day and the fire was over it by night and it was in the sight seen of all by all Israel. Well, the tabernacle initiative is a go. The Emmanuel era is a go. The beauty realm of heaven now has a beachhead on earth in the realm of thorns and thistles and slime and raw shikot and hamash, evil, corruption and violence or cruelty. And the manifest presence of the Holy One now dwells with mortal men. Oh, not since Eden, beloved, has communion between the Creator and fallen man been possible at this level of intimacy. As Moshe will later talk about this in the Torah, he's going to say, what nation is there? It has God so near to it as the Holy One, our God, is to us. For whatever reason we may call upon him. Deuteronomy 4, 7. So this era of Emmanuel is with us. God is with us, is in our midst, communing with us, and ruling over us is underway. But there is a, a glitch. There's a small problem at least as we begin the book. The Mishkan, the tabernacle's in place, it's furnished, it's occupied, it's seemingly ready for business, but the problem is that no one, not even Moshe or Aaron, can enter it. So what do we do now? How long can we ignore this elephant in the room, the creator in the camp? How long can we ignore the fact that he's there with us, but we can't interact with him? Now, we feel drawn in his direction, right? Don't you feel drawn? That's why you're here with the rabbi's son around the Shabbat table. We feel drawn in his direction. We're on this quest, this hunger, this seeking, this pursuit, as a moth is drawn to a candle flame. But I'm afraid we have all in this world seen with our own eyes how that tends to turn out for the moth. So, can we be the exception? Can we, mortal, unclean, profane human beings, converse intelligently and commune meaningfully with the immortal and perfect and holy God, the creator of the universe? He's only a few meters away now, but what is it going to take? What will it cost to bridge the distance and cross the great divide to actually enter that manifest presence? Well, it all starts with Vayikra, the first words, first phrase of the Torah portion, first phrase of the book of, of, the, of Leviticus, Vayikra, and he karad, and he called, and he, and he set us apart, and set us apart as his people. Wait, where have we seen this phrase Vayikra before? Ah, well, I've told you, it's in Genesis 1, 5, and 8, and 10, and 2.19, it's all shades of creation. It's the Holy One who does, it's part of his Elohim signature, how he calls us and sets us apart and sets boundaries for us and gives possibilities and potential to us and sets assignments for us all through this karateing. So it's familiar to us. It goes also in Genesis 3.9. We should remember Genesis 3.9 in the Garden of Eden. Vayikra, he said. Vayikra, the Torah says. Vayikra, Adonai Elohim, et ha'adam, ahika. And the Holy One came and he called unto Adam. And he said, ah, oh, where are you? Where are you? Remember the scene, the poignancy of the scene. This is that scene recreated again. When you see Vayikra, dance back in history. Dance. Where have we heard this before? Ah, oh, we're back to the garden. We're back to Adam again. And the Holy One is calling us and saying, Adam, 
It's like, son, my child, my person, my people. Where are you? Ayeka. Do you even know where you are? That's just like, right? we're supposed to hearken back to Genesis 3.9 and understand we're back again. And then uh, look again at Exodus 24, 16. The second part says that, Vaikra el Moshe by Yom Hashavi'i mitok anan. And the Holy One called for Karad Moshe on the seventh day into the great cloud. Oh, wow, that was the seeds, the shades of the throne room visitation, the reconnection of heaven to earth in Exodus 24. When the twenty, when the seventy-four went up the mountain and saw the Holy One, gazed upon him, and were not harmed, and ate and drank in his presence. Ah, oh, this is the the beginning of a real connection, of real intimacy, of real communion. It's at the heart of it. it has to start with thy cry and he called. We must be called. It's like the story of Esther, uh, and how uh, the Esther knew she must be called. Well. We will also see this phrase Vayikra again. If you look at the, the what the Hebrew would be behind the, the Messianic Chronicles, the stories of Yeshua the Messiah, we see Vayikra is the exact phrase that the inspired writers are going to be using to describe what Yeshua does with and to and unto those he disciples and he called. Them. We are called Mark one twenty three twenty three six seven. You could go on. There's probably fifteen uh, references. I don't know ten fifteen references in the, the, the Gospels, as they're called, of where Yeshua began interactions, began levels of communion and teaching to his people through this phrase, Vayikra. So this word, Vayikra, that's going to color the next few weeks of our studies together, our discussions together. It means this, that we have been karad, we have been called like unto that. So, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the advent of God with us, or Emmanuel, means that the stakes are about to go up dramatically in our walk with God, in our devotional life, in our atoning, our tuning, rather, our tuning into his true tone. And we're going to have to significantly step up our game. But he's going to meet us where we are. He's going to provide us what we need. Elevation and spiritual growth will come. They'll come through a regimen of prescribed safe exercises and disciplines of self-denial. When Yeshua said, he who must would follow me must uh, die to himself, must, must uh, self-deny, and, and take up his cross and follow me. These are the things, these are the kind of things he's talking about. There are covering protocols, and there are healing and purging protocols, and there are f repairing the soul, the mind, will, and emotion, and repairing the world protocols. Tikkun olam, tikkun nefesh protocols. All these are part of, all. if you will hear me, they're all part of the disciples' prayer Yeshua taught us to pray. These covering protocols, these healing and purging protocols, and these tikkun nefesh and tikkun olam protocols. Each of the paragraphs of the, uh, of the, of the disciples' prayer that Yeshua taught us to pray. Our Father, beginning with that, who art in heaven. The, these are all covered by these protocols. So, <laughs> Though flesh cannot stand in his presence, and human pseudo-intellect cannot function even, much less converse, on his level of true intelligence, the Holy One has gracefully extended his scepter to us the way Akashrash, the king of Persia, uh, extended his scepter to Esther. But how do you come? With what kind of humility are, should you come? With what level of passion and energy and, and with what gifts and what pledge of loyalty and what down payment on that pledge should we make our approach the place we've been invited to go you see is holy ground the one to whom we've been, been invited to visit is holy so this is going to be kind of like the burning bush but multiplied exponentially holy ground you don't just rush the gate at a place like that you don't just charge in like you own the place or are entitled to the tabernacle or it's his house it's his it's his house it's run by his rules it it has danger zones uh, because of the power of what we're dealing with here we're a guest in his courts and chambers and we need to do things his way and teach the world to do them his way as well just as in this the the season we're in which is the season of of reading of the of the megillah of esther the book of esther 
Welcome to the Bride Elect's how-to book of King's Court Etiquette, how to do these things, how to approach him. This is the Holy One's step-by-step -step guide to the ultimate extreme bridal makeover. We're uh, <laughs> Eliza Doolittle as we start this book, but we're going to come out <laughs> in a whole other form. We're going to come out as being coming the bride candidate of the creator of the universe. If we follow the protocols and the disciplines, this book is a manual of essential protocols for abiding in intimate communion with and then serving as a diplomatic core of our bridegroom king. So, he will give us beauty for ashes. He will make us, he will cause us, he will nurture us to become holy as he is holy. This is going to be a great journey, a journey from darkness into light. This journey will cause us to disentangle from that which is common and profane and instead absorb the energy and the inspiring power of that which is flowing from heaven. It will inspire and empower us to, to walk away and choose, unchoose, all that is unclean, all that is tamay, all that is fragmentation generating, all that causes a variation from true tone, to, uh, from sweet spot. All that is unclean, we will eschew. We will not choose it. We will unchoose it. And we will embrace instead the superior order, or the superior energy of that which is tahor, that which is bringing about wholeness, bring us back to true tone, the sweet spot. Ah, that is healing to that which is nurturing, to that which is wholeness producing, to that which is redemption bringing, tikkun, olam, establishing. So, so we have the tabernacle, we have the calling, the presence, the indwelling presence, the Holy One in it. We have now the call to come into and visit with Him. Uh, what will we do? Imagine if you can. Leviticus 26.3 and 11.42 is going to tell us, If, as, and when, and to the extent you walk in my statutes. Ah, key, walking in his statutes. And you shema, you treasure and cherish, and carefully guard my mitzvot, my instructions. And you build them, you saw them, you make them come into real function. If, as, and when, and you do these three things, I will set my tabernacle among you, he says. And my soul will not reject you. And I will walk among you. And I will be your God. And you will be my people. Ah, does that sound like we're getting some progress on our quest? The quest for which we do all these things every week. I will walk among you and be your God, he said. And you will be my people. That's where we're going in this book. The Creator Speak has returned and is going to return in full speak. We're going to have more Creator Speak in this book than we have received so far in the entire first two books of Torah. So we have to start by seeing ourselves called. You are called. You are under a calling right now. You are feeling the draw of a calling right now, I pray, to come into His presence, to begin to live and function and begin to, to be, reach true tone and sweet spot in his presence. Well, let's begin with the readings then. This is in the Hebrew, and I'll follow with the best English translation I can muster on short notice. Vayikra el Moshe vayadaber Adonai echa And he called unto or for Moshe, and then the Holy One spoke. So first the calling, then the speaking. Me'ohel mo'ed lemor. From within the tent of meeting, and he spoke. Daber el bene, this is actual creator speak now. Daber el bene Israel v'amarta, speak to bene Israel, the children of Israel, and say, Adam, <laughs> it starts with the word, Adam, Adam ki yachriv mikem korban l'adonai, when a man would make his approach, he would draw near to, for the Holy One, min ha Min abakar, u min hatzon, from the herd, or from the flock, a surrogate he should take. Takrivu et korban chem, for an approach, a drawing near, that is, he is to take. It is a down payment he's going to make. It is like a, a, a promise, a, a, a pledge, an earnest money on a pledge. That's what he brings is not the end result, the, the, the covering, it's just the down payment that this is, 
And so now we're looking behind the words. We're looking to the dancing behind the words, the ultimate of the mind and the heart. What are we doing if we're going to draw near to the Holy One? What are we bringing? What will be our pledge, the basis of our pledge, the basis of our of our gift, the basis of our surrender unto Him? It says, Im ola korbano min habaka. If a man's approach is an ola from the herd, is an ascending one from the herd, a higher level from the herd, zakar tamim yakri venu. Uh, he used to draw close with one who's tamim, one who is, is, uh, fully grown and healthy and male a whole. El patak ohel mohed, at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, yakriv oto irasono lifne adonai, approach and give up this, his free will. To surrender his free will before and unto the Holy One. Uh, that's what this is all about, surrendering the free will of the Holy One. And there he is to lay his hand upon the head of the Ola surrogate, the Nertsa Lo Lekafer Allah. And it will be acceptable to him to make a covering, a keeper for him. Well, the beauty realm lifestyle is now being offered to us. The first of the uh, essences of the divine speech that we're going to get, divine and creator speak, is the Korbanot Discourse. And that's chapters 1 through 8, basically. And this, these chapters tell us uh, how to approach him and, and traffic in his holiness and become courtiers in his courts. From there, we're going to go to the eighth day narrative. This will be a couple weeks down the road. We'll talk about the, what happened on the eighth day. The first narrative the, of the two narratives of the whole, the whole book will be there. Fire fell from heaven. The Dab and Abba who were consumed. The uh, discussions about how to approach and how important it is to approach it his way are going to be given. And then the great Kedusha Discourse. Uh, the manual for courtiers and ambassadors will be given. It's lengthy. It's the longest, could do, longest discourse of Torah, of the Bible for that matter, of divine speech. And then we'll have the blasphemer narrative, the f- closing with the, the, the uh, uh, bookend to the uh, eighth day narrative discourse, the blasphemer narrative. And that will be then introducing the final set of Vaikra, the final section of Vaikra, which will be establishing the kingdom of Bichet and taking it into the world, turning our hearts toward home and faith focus toward redemption. And then the, the warnings, the Takaka discourse will be toward the end, and the great redemption, Geula discourse, will conclude the book. Wow. <laughs> well, that is an amazing thing. That is amazing. But here we are. And I want to introduce uh, just one more thing or so before I, I end, and that is the tenth law of spiritual science. Earlier I gave you the ninth law of spiritual science. You can listen, go back and rewind and listen if you wish. Here's the tenth law of spiritual science with which we'll close. Remember, we're facing into the, the wind. We're facing the presence of the Holy One, the glory of God, and we want to enter in and commune with Him. But here's the law of spiritual science. Whatever character flaw that or spiritual malady that any person sees as being present in his fellow men. Whatever character flaw or spiritual malady any person sees as being present in his fellow men is also in and is alive also and active also and in the process also of wreaking havoc in and through that person himself. In other words, if you see it in someone else and it, you re, are repulsed by it, realize it's active, operating, in the process of wreaking havoc in your life as well. That is the reason why you see it, because it is active in your own life. Now, this is the key. Before we enter into the presence of the Holy One, before we approach reading about His Korbanot, or about His Kedusha, before we read about any of this stuff, we need to understand that there is in us this this urge. Whatever we feel the urge to judge is really judging us. Whatever we feel the urge to condemn or be repulsed by is really condemning and repulsing, being repulsed by us. Ah, the creator of the heavens and the earth searches and tries the heart of man, and he offers practical pathways of healing. Well, the pathways of healing that he gives this week are going to be the Ola, the complete self-surrender of the will. See, the will is the source of all problems with man. We lost our will in the garden. We gave our will to the serpent and to his serpentine thoughts. And no longer does our will belong to the Holy One. We're going to change that. 
Now, hold on, has a protocol, an app, a process to change that through the Ola. Now, are you worried about not being able to offer a lamb or a, a ram or a bull? Ah, the root behind the actual literal words. Go to the heart of the matter. Will you present your heart and your will to the Holy One? Will you say, as Yeshua said, not my will, but yours be done. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is the way he put it in his model of prayer. This is the Ola protocol. There's also a Mincha protocol. How do you look at the world? Do you believe that the, the material things of the world belong to you or should belong to you or that they're somehow wrongly distributed amongst rich and poor and, and nations? And are, are you concerned? Does it bother you? Does it get your will all in a tight that you see things in the world that are not the way you think they should be? Are you not grateful for the things that you have? Do you not believe the Holy One knows what he's doing in dispensing material things to men? and to nations, and to peoples, and to families. Do you not know, believe that? Do believe he has a plan for everything he's doing? If you do, then you need to go through the Mincha Protocol to return yourself back to true tone, to be thankful and grateful for that. This is what uh, what uh, Hevel uh, and, and Cain tried to do, and only Hevel was able to, to follow through, because his will was in it, and Cain's was not. Well, these are the things. And then there's the, the, the Shalom. Are you, do you feel angry at people? Are you offended? Are, are you, uh, are you not happy with people? Are you, do you feel like people are doing you wrong? People are doing wrong in the world and, and that, that is too much for you to bear and too much for you to have any shalom or peace. Ah, uh, you see, this is where the, the protocol, the disciplines of Korban Shalom come. If we're going to operate in true tone, we can't be offended. We can't be angry. We can't be frustrating and worried and stressing over what other men are doing. We, and that's why the psalmist will tell us, fret not over evil doers. These are the things. These are the, and the idea of Yeshua taught about this with regard to the, the uh, issue of the, of the fatted calf, killing the fatted calf. This is the Shalom. <laughs> the idea of the fatted calf is that we're going to all eat together and overcome our difficulties. And... Older brother difficulties, younger brother difficulties, uh, prodigal son versus faithful, theoretically faithful son. These are the issues we'll deal with. Uh, and then the issue, how do we respond to his words? Do we think his words are just, you know, nice to read about and study? Or do we actually live by them? Do they change us? Do they enter into our DNA and begin to live, be lived out in our flesh, in our thoughts, in our words? Uh, that's the issue of, of Korban Hata which people call a sin offering of all things. It, it's a retuning ourselves to the idea that our, his word it has primary place in our lives. And then finally, Korban Hasham, the fifth of the protocols, that he's going to teach us about approaching and dealing and being in, in true tone with him. It's going to be about how, we, how our emotions play out. How we, do, do we give our emotions room to hurt us and hurt our people around us? Or do we surrender the, mo the emotion state, our blame, shame game, uh, our, our guilt trips, and all the things that we wish? Do we surrender that to the Holy One as well? Do we give it the power to manipulate either ourselves or other people through emotion? Uh, that's the story of Parsha Vahikra. I hope you enjoy your studies together. I hope it stuns you and challenges you. And I hope it helps you in your quest to know the Holy One and be known by Him. Shabbat shalom. See you next week.